So uh, welcome you all to uh, our IAM for Developers Community Meetup uh, for the month of February 2022. So this is uh, in today's session, we are going to talk about an interesting topic, which is still uh, uh, in, uh, which is commonly talked in when you, when you work with us, um, public clients, so this topic is really important. So before uh, we started start the session, let me um, tell you a couple of uh, housekeeping stuff. Uh, so basically, uh, so this session is an interactive session. So feel free to unmute yourself. So at the moment, you all are muted. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute and let's uh, talk each other and let's make it an interactive session. And also like we'll do this recording. I mean, we'll record this session and you'll able to uh, weave this in YouTube. So whenever you want. And also we have uh, our public uh, um, channels, where community channels where you can interact. So my colleague will put them uh, the list of channels on the chat. So you please feel free to follow them and join with us in our next sessions. So, uh, yeah, so let me introduce myself and my colleague. So I'm Dinali Dabarera, an Associate Lead Solutions Engineer at WSO2, who is mainly focusing on identity and access management domain. And I'm an evangelist, I write blogs and do YouTubes. So feel free to join with me as well. And with me, I have my colleague Isuru Hetiarachi, who is a software engineer in the customer success team of WSO2, who is also focusing on identity and access management domain. And he has a lot of experience in the today's topic. So I, I joined with him to do this session so that you can get a hands-on experience on this today's topic. So let's dig in. So today's agenda, so we are gonna talk about what the heck is Depop and we, going, we are going to talk about how Depop uh, looks like and why it is there and the attack models we discuss here. And also you can weave, you can see how WSO2 identity server uh, helps you to implement this in your application. So let me, yeah, let me remove this. So let's go to the stats first. Like, do you know this um, Open ID Connect is this trending protocol uh, in the market, which uh, the usage is doubling every year. So basically, O2 is using full access delegation, and Open ID Connect is a standard protocol which we use for single sign on. So basically this use of this open, these two protocols is growing year, year on year, where this gives uh, the attackers to use this vulnerable things to attack your applications and get your data. So basically this replay attacks on access token and refresh token is most common when we think about, when we talk about the vulnerabilities in the list of identity and access management domain. And also uh, out of all the clients, public clients are the most vulnerable. So basically they don't have a storage to um, store the access token or refresh token in a secure manner. So in that case, like it is, this access token is more likely to be stolen or compromised when it comes to public clients. So, uh, for the newcomers or new joinees to this identity and access management domain, let me just roughly explain how this Open ID Connect or the O2 journey works. So basically, there are three actors in this uh, full journey where we have a client, we have an authorization server, which authorize this client to access a particular resource in a resource server. So, um, so normally a client will do first do the authorization or the token request to request an access token. 
So once he do that, this authorization server will authenticate that user and check whether he's authorized and then it'll issue the access token. And once uh, this access token is taken by the client, what it does is like, it'll use this access token to ex uh, access a resource. Like, and it, it can be an API server or an API manager where it calls, use this access token and get a call an API and get the data what he want. So during this journey, there is no place where it checks whether this access token, the person who gives this access token to the resource server is the correct owner of this access token. So as we don't have that validation, so there is a bit of a risk where this access token can be stolen and this attacker can do replay attacks on the resource server and access the protected resource with that access token. It is true that uh, this access token might have a short lived or might have a short expiry time, but still there is a risk uh, during that particular period. So this is the reason why we have Depop or why Depop was introduced. So what the heck is this Depop? So basically Depop is called demonstration of proof of possession. So this Depop will is a kind of proof that tells that this is the correct owner of the access token, or it validates the person who do the request call or the token request call is the same person who owns this or who is accessing this particular resource. It basically validates the client. So this is kind of an additional security that we have, I mean, that was implemented on, our, on top of the existing um, O2 flow or, or the OpenID Connect flow. So actually this was introduced in order to detect replay attacks, uh, which happens on top of access tokens and refresh tokens. And this is kind of an application layer, uh, application level security mechanism to uh, secure access tokens and refresh tokens. So if you have any question, just feel free to ask. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to read the chats right now. I'll take the chat questions at the end, but feel free to ask any questions if you have. And a little bit of a history of Depop. So Depop was not uh, introduced uh, um, it, it was introduced in 2019, which is uh, not really uh, past. So it, it was uh, recently introduced and still this is on draft state, but right now it's on the fifth version. And there are like six authors who have been involved in this, but uh, in the identity and access management domain, there are many vendors who have introduced this deep up because this is one of the, uh, most important thing when it comes to when you work with access token, it is uh, when you work with access tokens and public clients. So this is one of the concern that they all have. So hence due to that, they have introduced this Depop in their um, identity server or in their identity platform. So how this Depop works? So basically Depop is a JWT, which we additionally send as a header parameter uh, along with the, the with our typical standard request and responses flow. So normally the client has to generate this Depop, uh, the JWT, and he has to send it in the token request as a header. And the, uh, so once it is received by the authorization server, it has to do some extra validations. So basically from the validation, it verifies uh, the client. So the client, um, so later I'll explain like what is included in the Depop. So in the Depop, we have a public private key pair. Uh, so basically the public key is available. So with that, it validates the client and upon validation, the Depop 
uh, the authorization server will issue this access token. And there is a specialty in this access token as well. So this access token is bind to that DPOP or the, the public key of that particular user. So whenever the resource server or whenever a person receives that access token to uh, get a resource, so he can uh, check with the authorization server whether the client who is requesting this resource is the correct owner of this particular resource. So this uh, the special thing is this token type DPOP. So this DPOP type will tell that this access token is bound to a client or a public key uh, of that particular client. So it tells the, uh, the relation between the client and the access token. And the client, once the access token, the DPOP access token is received, he he can uh, he next will generate another DPOP with the same public private key. And then he use this DPOP to call the API with that particular access token that he received from the, the step B. And he calls this uh, API. And once the resource server received this API, he do this extra validation of the DPOP, uh, similar to authorization server. And then it does the um, introspect request to check whether this access token is valid or not. In the introspection request that it does, it tells this relationship between the client and the access token. So authorization server, so the resource server know that this is the correct owner who requests the resource. So upon these validation, it will send the protected resource to the client. So this DPOP will give you an extra validation upon the client uh, to make sure the, the access token is used by the correct client. Um, hope uh, it explains. So let's look at how DPOP looks like. So basically DPOP is a JWT, so it has this three sections, the header section and the payload section and the signature part. So signature uh, uh, was generated by, uh, I have removed the signature part because it's the standard signature part. Uh, so I have taken this header and payload part here. So um, this, uh, in order to generate a DPOP, a client has to generate a public private key pair. Uh, so basically, uh, so that will be unique to the client. So that's why uh, so we identify the client as a, uh, through this public private key. So in the header, what we put here is like in the header, we have the type, which is DPOP plus JWT. So normally in a JWT, we have the JWT type. But here, as this is a DPOP token or the DPOP proof, uh, the type would be DPOP plus JWT. And here we mention the algorithm, which we use to uh, encrypt this JWT token. Uh, so this should be always, there should be a value for this. And the algorithm should be an asymmetric signature algorithm. So here we do not expect any symmetric or even you can't put none, nothing. I mean, you have to have a value here. And the next attribute would be the, the public key. So the client, once the client generates the uh, private public key pair, he has to put the public key here uh, in this format uh, to tell that this is the, this is the owner of this particular uh, 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 the proof. So this is the proof of the position of this particular client. Um, so basically, uh, so in order to generate this, so we have introduced, so there is a specific way of generating this and uh, in WSO2, we have generated the client as well, which you can use to generate this DPOP. And uh, in the payload section, you can add whatever this, so normally payload contains the, the, cost, uh, the user information or you can put any data in the payload. But in the payload, we have like, four mandatory stuff, which is the first one is a unique identifier, which helps to uh, mitigate the replay attacks by, so will it'll help to uh, check 
uh, the uh, whether this DPOP is not using again and again. So this will be a unique identifier for each DPOP. And then we'll have uh, another two parameters called HTM and HTU, which gives you uh, some of information about the request that you are calling. If it is a token request, it'll contain the token endpoint and the request type either post or get. Uh, if it is an API call, it will include the API uh, the the API endpoint and the whether it's post or get. And there is another parameter called IAT, which is the expiry time. So this is also validated during this deep of validation. Uh, so normally, uh, this deep uh, the expiry time should be really low, maybe less than. Uh, one minute, which is which should be really low when it comes to um, when you're using DPOP. So that is specifically mentioned in the specification. So other than that, you can add additional information. So during the JW, uh, the DPOP validation, so it will validate the type first, and then it will validate the expiry time, whether it's an expired DPOP or not. And upon that, it'll do the signature validation. So uh, we can extract the uh, public key from the header itself, and we'll uh, the, the particular server can do the validation, uh, the signature validation by this public key available in the DPOP itself. And then uh, it'll do the uh, endpoint validation, whether the, this DPOP has come from the, uh, the correct, um, uh, I mean, whether they call the correct API uh, through this DPOP because DPOP contains those API information. So it will validate. So it will uh, help to mitigate this um, uh, replay attacks through that because you can't reuse this DPOP again and again because it has all these information which uh, this validation happens. Okay, so that's uh, about the DPOP. And let's look at how this DPOP is protect. I mean, how DPOP is used to protect your resource. So, so normally first in the client side, uh, the client, uh, so when, when the user logs in, the client has to create a public private key pair for that particular user. And he has to generate, the client has to generate this DPOP before this, uh, the user tries to authenticate or before the user clicks on the login button. So when generating this DPOP, uh, so the client will put this public key on the header and the payload will have this unique key and the expiry time and the information about the token endpoint. Because when you click on login, you either click the authorized endpoint or the uh, token endpoint just to receive the token. So you put those information and you sign it. And as, uh, as the third party doesn't have this private key, so he can't, I mean, nobody can uh, manipulate the data in this JWT. So once this uh, DPOP is prepared, the client can call the authorized uh, request or the token request. Uh, to the authorization server. And uh, when the authorization receives this DPOP, what it does is it first take the public key and do the signature validation as, as we do for all the JWTs. And once it's done, it'll check for the expiry time, whether this is an, this is an expired uh, DPOP, or then it'll check for the, um, the, the endpoint data, whether it's the correct endpoint that it does. And then it generates the access token. So when, when generating the access token, this access token will bind to the public key of that particular uh, client, which is sent with the DPOP proof. So this token will be bind to that public client. And this authorization server, once binding happens, this token will be issued to the particular client. And this client can use this token to call an API in the resource server. So when he's calling this API, he has to generate another DPOP because the DPOP expiry time is really low. 
So it has to be generated again and again, but we need to make sure for a particular access token or for, for, for a particular use at a time, we have to generate a single pair of keys because the access token will always bind to that particular public private key. So we have to use the same public private key. So when generating second DPOP to call that particular API, so we use the same private public key and generate a new DPOP and call the API with the access token. So I'll show you the how the format should be. And once you call that, the resource server will also follow the same process. Like he'll first uh, validate the signature uh, by extracting the public key. And then he checked for the expiry time. Once it's okay, he checks for the endpoint. And, and then he'll check for the, uh, the validity of the access token. For that, it'll either introspect and if it is a JWT access token itself, then it'll do the signature validation and um, and the other validations. And if it is introspect, when when you introspect in the response, it'll say the um, it'll uh, tell you the the public key of the client, which tells you that this this has a binding for a particular client. So this access token is a valid access token. So upon these validations, uh, the resource server can issue the resource. So it will be more protected when it comes to, a, I mean, than a typical uh, code flow. So hope it explains uh, you know, the, the journey of the DPOP. So you can, uh, so uh, Isuru will show you how this works in a practical scenario. So let's uh, look at how this, token request will look like with the DPOP. So, so with the DPOP, uh, so the, the, the token request will be the same as before, but there will be an additional attribute called DPOP in the header, which uh, where we put the DPOP proof as the header and send the uh, authentication request, uh, request like here in this example, I'll show you this. This is the authorization code grant type. So uh, where we send this DPOP as a header and we call this uh, token endpoint. So this is the token endpoint where we call for the access token. And then the response, uh, so the response would be the same. Here, the difference is the token type. Instead of token or uh, ID token type, we have this new type called DPOP. So this is this will tell us that there is a DPOP proof bound to this access token. Uh, yeah. So this is how the response will looks like. So this access token can be an opaque access token or a JWT. So here I show the... Uh, the OPEC format of the access token. And uh, when you call a resource uh, through with this access token, so normally what we, how we do is like, we put the authorization and we put the access token, but here it's different. When we call, we have to put the authorization header and we have to put TPOP in front of the access token. And then, uh, as a header parameter, we need to send another DPOP, which was generated from the same private public key. So once you uh, do this call, you will get the resource back as the response. So let's uh, discuss like what are the attack models that have considered when they design this DPOP. So basically there are a few attack models which helps to design this DPOP specification. So the first is this misconfigured resource endpoint. So in a case like uh, if there is an attack in the middle and if he has misconfigured one of the endpoints the, or the resource endpoints that uh, user is accessing, then there is a, a good chance that once uh, the attacker receives the access token, he can do a replay attack by using that access token to, uh, to get the resource 
back from the resource server. So in order to, uh, so how we mitigate that is, so when we do this deep up token call or deep up resource request call, we have an additional parameter, which is the deep up proof, which we have to do this uh, deep up proof uh, validation when uh, doing this, uh, when, when sending the resource back to the client. So in that case, if attacker sends the same deep up, uh, to the resource server, it will know. Um, so the, from the validation, the expiry time might fail, and also the uh, so there is endpoint. Uh, the endpoints are mentioned in the uh, the token itself. So as the attacker doesn't have the pub, private key, he cannot change the DPOP endpoints information. So that resource server knows that this is not the correct person who is sending the uh, request. So it will not give the resource back to that attacker. So there is one scenario where one attack model, uh, so we consider in this TPOP specification. And the other one is much more similar to here. So here, the resource server itself can be a malicious one, where uh, so the, the correct resource server will be a different one. But in the middle, we have another malicious resource server. Little, which will replay the same request and get the resource to the, uh, not to the client, but to, uh, but to the attack itself. So this is also mitigated by, our, by this DPOP method because it will do some extra validation to check the owner of the particular uh, access token. Yeah, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. And the other attack model is the stolen tokens or um, stolen tokens where like whenever uh, an access token is stolen, if the attacker tries to call this access token uh, directly to the resource server, he can't use it because uh, when it comes, so when the author, when the resource server introspect, it tells that this is a deep of type access token. So, then there is an extra validation that it has to do. So the DPOP is a must to be sent when you work with this DPOP tokens. So then uh, although this access token is stolen, nobody can use it because, uh, because they don't have this DPOP and uh, they, they can't tell that he is the correct owner of this access token. And the other one is uh, this, you know, this deep up also can be stolen. So how do we uh, make sure uh, this uh, replay attacks won't do if the deep ups are pre-computed or stolen? But still like, uh, although this deep up is stolen by an attack and use this again and again, so normally this deep up is also have a short live. So it's like a one-time token that it'll expire soon. And um, so you can't use it uh, again and again. Uh, so in the specification, it tells that it has to be uh, regenerated again and again when you are using, and it has to be short-lived, really short-lived. Uh, so in that case, it also uh, fails the extra validation that it does, and the attacker cannot uh, use any of the resources in our resource servers if we follow this deep up uh, mechanism. So basically, uh, when it comes to public clients, it's, it, it is recommended to use either PKC or this TPOP is another way of like uh, protecting your access tokens uh, from replay attacks. So if you're interested, feel free to try this out. So let's, uh, so I'll hand this over to Isuru to show you how this DPOP works with WSO2 identity server so that you will get a clear idea like how you can try this out in your applications. Over to you, Isuru. So uh, I'll uh, do a quick demonstration uh, uh, on how to generate uh, this DPOP uh, token and how to, uh, in, how to get the access token and how to uh, access a uh, protected resource using this uh, DPOP uh, tokens uh, but uh, more 
before moving on to that, uh, so these are uh, uh, some quick information about the Depop with AWS Identity Server. So Depop is an extension for the Identity Server, AWS Identity Server. So it will be not uh, available out of the box it, uh, in the Identity Server, but it will be uh, available uh, as an extension. So uh, it's currently available in this uh, repository. So you can basically uh, clone this repository and build this uh, extension and add it to the uh, WS Identity Server. If not, uh, we will be uh, releasing this uh, uh, extension uh, in the WS to Identity Server, uh, WS to uh, Connectors Store as well in uh, in near future. And also in in the current WS to Identity Servers, uh, this this is uh, supporting for the uh, version 5.10.0 and 5.10.5.11.0 uh, with the latest updates. And it will be available with the Ident Server uh, 5.12 uh, general availability release as well. And uh, so, so let me explain how to uh, uh, configure this uh, Depop in WS Ident Server first. Uh, so basically, what you have to do is uh, first uh, uh, at the moment. This is only available with this uh, repository, so you can uh, clone this repository and build this uh, build this component. And once once we build this component, uh, there will be a J jar file available. So we need to uh, copy that jar file to uh, Ident Server Dropins directory. So this is the uh, path we need to uh, add this jar file, and also. Uh, after adding this jar file, we need to add some configurations to uh, to this deployment toml file, which is which is central uh, file uh, available in WS2 Ident server, where we can uh, uh, configure all the configuration uh, file based configuration in Ident server. So we need to add these uh, details into the deployment toml file. I'll quickly show. So these are the details. So in basically we are uh, uh, defining, we are using this VPOP uh, interceptor and uh, VPOP token validator in double sign server. Also uh, one thing we need to uh, keep an eye on is this uh, header validity period. So this will define the uh, uh, period uh, the uh, DPOP token will be valid. So we should, as uh, Dinali mentioned earlier, we should uh, always set this uh, header validity period to a lower number. So right now I have set it as 90 seconds. So this is in seconds. So uh, we can uh, control the validity period from here. Uh, so this will be one of the key points that uh, we need to keep on mind uh, when we configured Depop with WS and server. And in the demonstration, I will be, uh, uh, so I, I explain how to uh, do the basic uh, configuration in the Depop with Ident Server. So we need to copy the jar file and we need to add the uh, configuration to the deployment of .toml file. And I'll demonstrate how to enable it, uh, uh, Depop in a service provider in uh, double strand Server. Then I will uh, show a quick, uh, uh, client application we have uh, implemented to uh, generate Depop uh, tokens. And then I'll do a, a demonstration on how to generate an access token using Depop and also how to invoke a protected resource using uh, uh, Depop in Ident server. So moving on. Uh, so once we uh, configure this configuration in Alambulus to Ident server, so uh, copy the jar file and also uh, configure these details in the deployment of Tumble file. Uh, so then we can uh, enable Depop for a specific service provider in WSTIN server. I'll, this is the management console of WSTIN server. So I'll quickly log in to this. And uh, in our WS Client Server, we can manage service providers in here. So uh, I have already created the service provider for this Depop demonstration. 
which is uh, called the COP demo. And if I go into that, And uh, in in this uh, inbound authentication configuration, we can uh, configure or to or open ID configuration for this service provider. So I have already created uh, or configured this uh, or OIDC configuration in this service provider. But let me uh, quickly show uh, how to enable uh, Depop for this uh, auth application. If I go to the edit part, yeah. Uh, so uh, grant types are uh, uh, same as in the uh, uh, in uh, normal uh, uh, O2 application, uh, but uh, Depop is uh, coming as an uh, access token binding type. So basically, we have uh, the access token binding type, uh, cookie based or association based, and uh, like that, we can enable Depop based access token binding from uh, these settings. So once we uh, configure the double sign server to support Depop, we'll be getting this option as well. So we can uh, select the Depop uh, X token binding type as Depop based from this menu. And then uh, we can enable this validate token binding. So uh, when we enable this uh, option, uh, it will uh, always check, check the binding of the access token before performing any uh, any action with this uh, access token we are getting with the service provider and also for the demonstration i have i have uh, uh, selected this jw2 uh, self uh, self contained access token for demonstration we can also use uh, uh, opac or the default token issuer as well for the demo, uh, with the uh, depot but for the demonstration i have selected uh, JWT as the access token issuer. So I'll quickly update this. So that's how you uh, enable or configure a service provider for uh, service provider to work with uh, Depop in WS client server. So I'll update this as well. Uh, and uh, so you can get the uh, auth to uh, client key and uh, auth to or uh, client secret from here. So I'll be using this uh, uh, client uh, key and client secret to generate access token and uh, uh, to generate access token. Uh, so that's how you uh, configure in uh, in the management console for the service provider for, uh, to enable the depot. And then uh, let's move to uh, show a quick uh, client application or, or the Depop client application we have implemented to generate Depop uh, access, uh, Depop tokens, basically. So uh, it's available in this, uh, this repository. Uh, this is one of our uh, colleagues uh, who have uh, created this, uh, implemented this uh, Depop client application. Uh, so you can access uh, this client application. This is publicly available. Uh, so you can access this, uh, uh, repository and uh, get the source code so you will be able to uh, implement or, or get the reference on how to uh, implement a deep of access talk deep of token so i have uh, cloned this uh, clone that uh, repository here so uh, in here we have i'm not going into uh, in detail how to how the implementation has is done in uh, this uh, this application or, or this client. So, but basically what we need to uh, keep an eye on is uh, this uh, JWT claims. So we are setting these claims here. Uh, as Dinali mentioned, uh, one of the main two claims or, or uh, attributes should be uh, uh, important attributes in the deep token is, uh, uh, IAT, so IAT is uh, the issuer time, so it, it is setting as a, uh, as a system current time, uh, and also one other is uh, other thing is uh, HTM and HTU. So HTM is the uh, uh, request type, so it should it could be post a get uh, patch or something. So we need to set that uh, according to the, according to our uh, uh, request we are uh, what we are going to invoke 
and also HAU, which is uh, which will contain the endpoint of the uh, resource or the uh, uh, request we are sending. So we need to keep an eye on this. So I'll uh, generate the public key uh, they are from uh, this uh, class. So we can this. And uh, we have uh, generated the new uh, key. So these are the key details. So this will be available in, in the uh, DPOP token. And after generating the uh, key pair, we can uh, generate the DPOP token. So this is uh, this will uh, this class will be uh, uh, this, will, this class will use this uh, uh, key pair and uh, in, generate a JWT, which, which, will, which will be using as the DPOP token for our uh, demonstration. So I'll uh, run this class as well. So when you run this, uh, will be, uh, there will be JWT generated. So this is the output of the uh, JWT. So I'll copy this and show what is that's the content of this uh, JWT. I'll be using JWT IO for that. So you can see uh, the type of the uh, uh, token is Depot plus JWT, and we have the algorithm as Dinali mentioned, and we have the public key information here. And also we have other information in the payload. Uh, so we have uh, HTM, which is uh, uh, indicating the uh, uh, request uh, type. So it could be, uh, as I mentioned, it could be post, get, or patch, or uh, anything. And we have HTU, which is indicating the endpoint of the uh, request. And uh, then there's a JTI, which is a unique identifier for the uh, uh, this JWT, and other details as IAT and not before uh, timestamp as well. So so this is uh, uh, JWT or the Depop JWT token we will be using to invoke, uh, we'll be using to get an or generate an access token in WS time server. And for, for, the, for this demonstration, I'll be using uh, password done uh, in the WS time server to uh, generate the uh, uh, access token. So, uh, will be uh, this. This is the uh, endpoint of the auth uh, uh, token endpoint, uh, and in the body, I will be uh, setting the password, contact pass password, username and password, also a score which which we can uh, which we will need to uh, invoke uh, one of the protected resources in WSIN server as well, and this. Uh, 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 these are uh, pretty common uh, com uh, common payload. This is a pretty common payload. But uh, what we need to focus is headers. So in here, uh, since we are uh, we are getting a depot bind depot binded uh, access token, we need to uh, pass the depot token as a header uh, in this uh, way. So we, we uh, key will be depot as as here, and also we need to uh, add the depop token as the value. So I'll demonstrate. I'll generate a uh, depop token with the relevant information. So I will have to uh, use this endpoint as the HTU value. If not, it will work. So. I'll put this here and generate the new token. I'll copy that and I'll use it here and I'll send the request to this endpoint. So, so once we uh, do the do this properly or in the correct way we will get the response uh, or the access token response in this way and 
you can see uh, this is a JWT access token since I have selected JWT for this demonstration and we have the refresh token and also you can see the token type so basic in in a no um, if we don't use depo this uh, token type will be bare right but since we you since we are using a depo token the token type is coming as depo so this is uh, mentioned in the specification as well so if we are getting a depo token it, the token type will be uh, depo as here and also uh, if i go to the client application which we use to generate the uh, depop token uh, we can see this thumbprint so this is the thumbprint of the uh, public key uh, of this uh, uh, depop token so so this this uh, thumbprint is also available in this access token as well uh, and if i copy this access token and show you the content So this is the access token content, and we have this binding type as depop and other uh, general information in the payload. And also we have this uh, CNF claim. So this CNF claim has this uh, this binding or the thumbprint of the public key. So this value is same as the value of the uh, depop token we have here. So this value and uh, this and this value is same. So this is how we uh, identify this uh, this access token is bound to this particular uh, depop token. So if we are uh, going to uh, use this JWT or this uh, this access token for self validation, we can use this uh, CNF claim or, or the JKT claim. To get the thumbprint, and since uh, when we use the depop token, we have to send the depop uh, token when we uh, invoke a protected resource. So we get we can get the depop token and this JWT token, and we can match this uh, thumbprint of both tokens and validate that uh, this tokens uh, this token is uh, sent by uh, by the same client that is it, it was issued. So also let me quickly show if we change something in in this HTU endpoint uh, or, or HTU claim. Uh, so I'll add something like this and generate it again. So the thumbprint won't be changed since we, we, we are using the same uh, public and private key pair we generated earlier, uh, but the uh, this HTU claim will be changed. So if we use this uh, depop token to invoke the uh, auth to endpoint or to token endpoint, it will be failed because of the validation of the HTU claim. Yeah. So if we are getting this error message uh, as the proof is uh, in the lane. So this is basically due to this uh, claim uh, validation. So we need to provide the actual endpoint when we invoke uh, access token as well as when we invoke a protected resource. So I can read this again. I I, uh, I use this access token to invoke one of the protected resources in WS Identity Service itself. So, when we invoke a protected resource with the depop bind, uh, depop access token, we need to provide that access token with uh, this uh, way. So, so basically, uh, access token will be sent in the authorization header and in, in, in normal uh, or to or open IDC, uh, IDC, we will be using this uh, where keyword 
and then the access token, right? But uh, when you're using a default access token, we need to send uh, then uh, it has DPOP and then the access token. We can't use the bearer. We need to send it as the uh, DPOP and then the access token. So I'll replace this token here. And with this, we, we also need to send the DPOP token. Uh, token as well that that's uh, generated again and bound to this access token so this deep of token it, it needs to be uh, uh, created or signed with the same public and private key pair and it, it should also contain this uh, this uh, this value correctly so we need to uh, put the stm and uh, or and the HTU values correctly to uh, invoke this protected resource. So if I use this, uh, this DPOP token, which we use to generate the access token, so it, this will be containing uh, these values, right? So, so the IAT is, uh, so basically this has uh, HTU as the token endpoint and the HTM as uh, post, and other values as well. So I'll be, I'll use this for the demonstration. So if I use this DPOP token, it will send a 401 uh, status code saying it is unauthorized. So this is because uh, this DPOP token is not valid. So we are trying to invoke this scheme two endpoint, scheme two users endpoint of the WSTIM server but we are using a DPOP token, which is generated to uh, get an access token. So basically because of that, DPOP, access, uh, DPOP token validation is failing here and we are receiving the uh, 401. So if I generate the DPOP token with the correct details, we'll be able to get the uh, response or, or uh, correct response from this endpoint protected resource. I'll replace this HQ with the scheme to users endpoint. And since we are uh, using, uh, we are trying to think of, or you trying to get get code, I'll send to get and I'll generate another DPOP token. I have generated the new deep of token and if I quickly show you context of this uh, deep of token, we can see the scheme is get and the stu is uh, scheme to users and other details are also there. So I use the same to invoke this scheme to users endpoint. I'll replace that value here. Since, since we use uh, the correct BPOP token with the correct claims, we are able to get the uh, 200 response and we are uh, we are able to invoke this protected resource uh, from the Dubstein server. So like this, we can, uh, we can generate an access token uh, with BPOP, uh, Depot bounded bound access token providing this depot uh, token when we generate access token and you, we can use this depot token depot access token to invoke a protected resource uh, in this manner so we'll have to uh, send the access token saying it is an it is an depot access token uh, instead of bearer and we also need to send another deep token generated using the same uh, private and uh, public key pair but uh, we need to uh, change the claims of that deep uh, token to match it the endpoint we are trying to know like HTA claim htm uh, claim those things so i think you you uh, got an uh, understanding on how to use 
how to generate an access token and how to invoke a protected resource uh, with DPOP, uh, DPOP uh, in WSI server. And if you have any questions, so you can uh, raise them. That will be the end of my uh, demonstration. Yes, Israti, we have a question. Um, so I already answered, but it's an it's an interesting question. So if there is mutual TLS based trust, then do we still need DPOP? So that's the question. Um, so basically, this DPOP is considered as another mechanism that we can use instead of mutual TLS. So whenever if we are I mean, if we have the possibility to use mutual TLS, then that is recommended. But in a scenario where like, if you have um, single page applications, which cannot be used uh, mutual TLS or like, which is a public client at all, then definitely uh, this DPOP is a recommended mechanism, which does the same process, which proves that this is the correct user who is accessing the resource, who owns the access token. <clears throat> uh, so that's it. Um, and yes, uh, so actually Depop will be out of the box available in 5.2.0. Out of the box means, so we have some components in the identity server out of the box itself, but you still need to get this connector, uh, which is in our extensions. So you, you need to put both. So basically this out of the box uh, of the functionality will be available with 5.12. And then on top of that, you can use this connector and use the full feature. Um, yeah. But if you are a subscribed customer who is using identity server, then definitely you will have this in 5.10 and 5.11 as well. Okay. <laughs> So I think that's all what we have for today in our agenda. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I think we have more 30 minutes remaining. I think um, that's all for today. So uh, thank you very much. So we're planning to do similar sessions every month or twice, I mean, twice a month, um, yeah. So please keep in touch with us so that uh, we can, uh, so we'll put whatever the sessions we have in our meetup uh, group as well as our LinkedIn. So please do follow us. So um, hope you enjoyed today's session and you gained some knowledge on how to work with the single page applications and how to secure your applications. So thank you so much for joining with us and raising questions and have a nice day.